Hello. Yes. Hi. It's a different face here today. Christmas out of town. Anyway, hello. My name is Julia Stelo Jacobs, um, and I work for the Extreme Industry Project. If you don't know, we are a nonprofit um, public history organization here in Bozeman, and we like to, yeah do all the things we can to bring history to the public. We do this with our lecture series. Um, we currently have, our walking tour season is currently in bloom. Um, we are actually going into the last month in August of um, tours. And if you haven't joined, please come. We would love to see you. And um, we also have a podcast that's called Dirt on the Past. and. Uh, once October comes around, look for History After Dark. We're going to have that on again this year. Um, but anyway, um, we're looking forward to have Patrick Lozar here tonight um, for the lecture on this beautiful Friday night. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I want to thank um, our sponsor, the um, um, Native American Studies Department from MSU. Um, they are located in the beautiful Native American Indian Hall on campus, and um, they provide an important space for the Native American community on campus, along with providing an advanced and quality education for and about American Indians of Montana, the region, and the nation. Uh, so thank you, MSU Native American Studies Department. Also, thank you so much for the Museum of the Rockies for having us here tonight and um, supporting us throughout all the years. Um, we've been here for many, many years doing our lectures. So thank you so much. Um, but now Patrick. Um, Patrick Lozar is the Dean of the Native American Studies Division at Salish Kutli College in, Pulsen, in Pablo, Montana, where he's an enrolled member of the Confederate Salish and Kutli tribes. He received his PhD in history from the University of Washington in 2019 I taught in the history department at the University of Victoria, British Columbia, before returning home to Polson on the Flathead Indian Reservation. Uh, Lozar's academic research focuses on the historic experiences of indigenous communities with the Canada-United States border on the Columbia Plateau. His research has been published uh, in the Journal of Ethno-History and the Montana Magazine of um, Western History. So please join me in welcome Welcoming Dr. Patrick Lozar. Okay. How's that? Uh, wow. It's great to be here. Lend lunch for that introduction. Um, and thank you to the Extreme History Project uh, for allowing me to come share tonight and to uh, MSC's Native American Studies Department for. Uh, for sponsoring this event. And thanks to all of you for coming out on a Friday night to a lecture, history lecture. That's wonderful. I have a lot to compete with in Bozeman, but uh, I really appreciate you all uh, coming out tonight. Um, and uh, like Julie said, like, thanks to the Museum of the Rockies uh, for allowing us to, uh, to do this. Uh, I've been coming to the museum uh, geez, since I was a kid, and I was thinking, I think Jurassic Park came out when I was a kid, and this was the place to be when, when you want to learn more about dinosaurs. But, uh, the momentum from that movie. Um, as, as mentioned, um, I am from, from Polson, and I did my undergraduate degree here at Montana State University, got my, my BA in history uh, back in the 2000s, and with that affiliation in mind, I should say that as of next month, I'll actually be taking a, an assistant professor position at the University of Montana, uh, so uh, in, in the Native American Studies Department there, so you can Imagine me being a little conflicted about this new chapter in uh, my life, but uh, I'm excited to be uh, moving to Missoula with that, uh, that opportunity. Uh, so I grew up on the Flathead Indian Reservation, and uh, my family and I, on my dad's side, are members of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, and uh, my grandmother was uh, a Cinnaboy, uh, enrolled in Cinnaboy at the Fort Peck Reservation, and uh, she was from Poplar, and she had a way of making Poplar, Montana sound like just the center of the universe, a place that everyone wanted to be, and someday I'm going to get there because it sounded so awesome the way she talked about it. Uh, but at Flathead, at Flathead, uh, the, uh, our confederation 
which includes the Kootenays or the Kasanka, uh, that band in our tribal confederation are part of the larger Tanaha Nation, whose uh, Aboriginal territories are located in Montana, Idaho, and British Columbia. And as a trans-border Indigenous nation, I've been interested in this dynamic for much of my professional and, uh, and academic life, and this, this interest in our communities opened a window for exploring further the impacts of international borders and the histories of Indigenous peoples in North America. So I've been researching the historical dimensions uh, of this topic for a decade. I'm currently uh, working on a book on the topic. And this research uh, for, the, uh, for the research took me to communities and archives uh, all over North America, from British Columbia to Ontario, from Washington State to Washington, D.C. And, um, you know, after graduate school in Seattle, I taught for, as mentioned, I taught for three years at the University of Victoria in British Columbia on, on Vancouver Island. And, um, you know, when we, when we lived there in Canada, I, I visited home in the U.S., uh, pretty frequently, um, traveling more or less unrestricted across the, the, the border back and forth. But it was uh, my, during my time in, in uh, British Columbia that COVID hit in early 2020, and uh, Canada and the U.S. shut down the border uh, between both countries in order to stem the, the flow of the, of the pandemic. And that meant my wife and two kids and I were unable to leave Canada uh, for the foreseeable future. And this border episode, border closure episode, uh, put my project on Native nations in the, in the border into much sharper relief. I, I didn't intend to engage in this kind of experiential uh, research, but, but the, the, uh, the experience, the interface experience came to me nonetheless. Um, it's not that I didn't already deal with the anxieties of cross-border travel. I often deal with the anxiousness of driving up to the, uh, to the port of entry, illogically thinking, Okay, am I harboring any illegal uh, fruit? Uh, do I have a shotgun shelter in my bag? Uh, I don't have a shotgun, but uh, you know that, that kind of anxious thinking, you know, when you uh, pull up to customs and you start rehearsing your travel plans to make sure you get your story. Like, that's silly, but that's what, uh, that's what happens uh, when, you, when you get to uh, those, those stations. Has anyone traveled to Canada lately? Back and forth? Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a different endeavor since the, since the pandemic, but it's opening up more and more. In terms of reputation, before the pandemic and really on through today, the Canada-United States border has been seen as a kind of, kind of afterthought, a, a funny or innocuous thing, certainly compared to the U.S.-Mexican border, which gets uh, the bulk of the attention in the, in the media and in scholarship for, for being seen as a kind of a place of extremes. But the northern border, shares with all international borders the fact that they're sites of separation, security, jurisdiction, violence, and displacement. And the Canada-U.S. border is a long one. Uh, at 5,525 miles in length by land, that would be about the distance between Bozeman, Montana, and, uh, and Quito, Ecuador. So it puts things in perspective, just how long it actually is. And the purposes and modes of border enforcement, they're not timeless. They have a history. Enforcement has also been unevenly applied. That is, not all border crossers experience border enforcement measures in the same way. And this is certainly true of indigenous peoples upon whose lands the Canada-United States border was drawn. For them, this foreign entity came into their lives incrementally over time. And of course, Native nations deal with this border today. Native American tribes and First Nations assert their sovereignty uh, to engage politically with other governments. Communities along the line also are engaging the border. For instance, when the pandemic hit, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout was ramping up in the United States in 2021 with a focus on getting the vaccine to Native American communities who were found to be some of the most vulnerable of the U.S. population. But in Canada, the ability of uh, Canada and Canada's First Nations to get their first dose of the vaccine was lagging by comparison. So what the Blackfeet tribe of Montana do? They set up a vaccine clinic at the northern uh, boundary of their reservation, which also happens to be the Canada-U.S. border. And uh, they made their excess doses available to their Blackfoot kin from Alberta. Blackfoot, fo uh, Blackfoot folks ventured down to the border station by the carloads to receive a vaccine shot from their cousins. A few months later, the Kumi tribe of Idaho from Bonner Shaveri 
They set up a clinic at the Port Hill border crossing uh, for their Tanaha kin from the Lower Kootenai Band from Preston in British Columbia. And these present day instances of mutual support among border tribes demonstrate the enduring indigenous community connections be beyond the boundary line. But even more, these connections were pronounced during the pandemic at a, at a time that strengthened that border's capacity to divide North Americans. It's an interesting counter counterintuitive. So uh, let's get to the, uh, the background of these connections and these, these divisions here. In terms of geography, Montana's section of the Canada-US border is quite diverse. It runs through two major uh, watershed drainages and several rivers from the, the Kootenai River, the Milk, the, uh, the Poplar, and it's perpendic perpendicular to the Continental Divide. Uh, which sets at the crest of the Rocky Mountains and separates the vast northern plains uh, from the interior Pacific Northwest at the Upper Columbia River uh, drainage. And just as interesting, uh, much of the, say, past 300 years or so of human history on this northern space has occurred on multiple axes as well. And the bulk of this activity centered on big game hunting, specifically bison. Bison on the northern plains moved in all directions, from the Missouri River up to the South Saskatchewan River and beyond. And bison hunting took on a new dynamic when indigenous peoples incorporated horses into their movements. Horses ar uh, arrived through indigenous trade networks from the south uh, through the 1700s. The territorial ranges expanded and hunting grain uh, practices sped up and in turn, Native nations uh, themselves expanded or contracted. In the north, this included the Nitsitipi Blackfoot or Blackfeet, the Anin, the Grovan, the Nakoda, the Assiniboine, the Nahewak, the Plains Cree, and others to the north, to the south, to the east. By the early 1800s, the Métis, people of mixed indigenous and European heritage. Economic and political shifts also pushed and pulled peoples such as the Tanaha or the Kootenays from the plains in the east to the mountains in the west and back and forth for, uh, for bison hunts. <laughs> also in the 1700s, the colonization of North America by the French, the Spanish, and the British empires was well underway. As well, by the later 1700s, fur traders from major European and North American fur companies had begun penetrating the Northern Plains and the Rocky Mountains. And at the same time, after 1783, Northern North America was claimed by either the British Empire or the United States. And both of these entities, which were frequently antagonistic with each other since the American Revolutionary War, looked west. Uh, from the eastern seaboard and began to make designs in these far-off regions. After the conclusion of the War of 1812, which ended in 1815, the U.S. and Britain looked to normalize political relations with each other, starting with sorting out boundary issues in the West. In 1818, diplomats organized a convention in which they agreed to extend the dividing line of jurisdiction and sovereignty between the United States and British North America from the Lake of the Woods in present-day Manitoba and Minnesota, along the 49th parallel latitude, out to the crest of the Rocky Mountains. The 49th parallel was plotted somewhere between the northern boundary of the Louisiana Purchase here, uh, and which had gone to the Americans, and the uh, Red River Valley's watershed extends up to the south. In the west, the convention determined that the region known as the Oregon Country west of the Continental Divide would be jointly administered and occupied by both British and Americans. And this joint occupation arrangement would, be, uh, would remain for the next several decades, that is until the 1840s, when the British were compelled to dispense with that joint status and uh, exchange it for a fixed border up in the West. So in 1846, the Treaty of Oregon simply extended the boundary line between the two powers uh, along the 49th parallel from the, uh, the, from the divide out to the Salish Sea. And note that these treaty deliberations, uh, neither of them considered or consulted with the indigenous nations upon whose lands they were discussing. And of course that abstract line was a fiction for the people on the ground, particularly since there was nothing physically marking the border on the, on the ground. 
So many indigenous ongoing political, social, economic activities really continued uninterrupted, including bison hunting, participating in the fur trade with the HBC, the Hudson's Bay Company, and with Americans, riding, uh, raiding on horseback, holding ceremony and cel cultural celebrations that connected members of these nations. At the same time, however, now that the political line had been established and they no longer, uh, it would no longer interfere with each other, the British and, and U.S. governments began making plans for their western territories through the 1840s and 1850s. On the United States side, it had become a basic component of affecting state sovereignty in the West to extinguish, quote, Indian title to tribal lands and to establish reservations, or at least to make Western indigenous nations appear more orderly or legible on colonial maps. One of the first attempts at this out here was with the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1851. In this council, tribes from all over the Missouri River Valley met with representatives from the United States government to sort out issues arising from Oregon Trail pioneers trespassing on their lands, and with conflict from intertribal competition. And this meeting also included a and an Aan and uh, delegates uh, from the north. Now to make sense for some of, these, uh, of some of these issues, the U.S. Treaty Party created a map that, as they understood the situation, reflected the boundaries of each tribal nation. And as you can see, up in the north, that map was bound by the 49th parallel. The council itself and the map was something of a farce due to its inability to reflect the, the realities of mobile uh, hunting peoples or the social ties of indigenous nations. Uh, but it did establish some of the first political relationships between the United States and the tribes of this region. Uh, the Blackfoot and Blackfeet were not present at this uh, Fort Laramie Council, but they would be targeted uh, for consultation of, uh, for a meeting four years later. By the mid-1850s, the U.S. government had grown interested in constructing a railroad connecting the Midwest to the Pacific Northwest. And so they dispatched Washington Territorial Governor Isaac Stevens, who's also the uh, Indian superintendent of the, of the territory, to meet with regional tribes about land sessions and about hunting reserves. In July of 1855, delegates from the Salish and Calispe, or the upper uh, Pongare, uh, as well as representatives of the Kootenai Nation, met with Stevens at present day, uh, near present day, Missoula, at Council Grove. <clears throat> Offering promises of protection and of payment, Stephen asked, Stevens asked our tribes to relinquish to the U.S. government the bulk of their aboriginal territories and reserve lands for themselves. The lands in question included those, quote, commencing on the main ridge of the Rocky Mountains at the 49th parallel of latitude, thence westwardly on the, that parallel to the divide between the Platte Lower Kootenai River and the Clark Fork, unquote. The Kootenai's, uh, the Kootenai People's Territory did not start at that line at latitude, nor did it end there. But for Stevens, as representative of the United States, it certainly did. The Hellgate Treaty created both a new northern boundary of the Kootenai's uh, and it created a government-to-government -government relationship between the United States and the tribes that became known as the Flathead Nation. But Stevens was not done yet. Stevens and his superiors in Washington, D.C. resented the realities of the Northern Plains borderlands, in which Blackfoot and Assiniboine peoples continued to trade with the British North, uh, Hudson's Bay Company. U.S. officials complained of Blackfeet bands near the border leaving U.S. jurisdiction and trading with foreign entities and just being out of American control. And in some cases, uh, you know, Blackfeet hunters and traders, they'd kill one bison, sell the meat to the Americans, and the robe to the British. So they're pretty good at strategizing in this, this borderland space. But after the Hellgate Treaty Council with the Kootenays and others in summer of 1855, Stevens met with Blackfeet bands and the band of Ananan to work out a plan for establishing peace among the upper Missouri uh, tribes and to tie the southern Pagan bands and leaders to the United States. In a large gathering that took place over just a few days near the mouth of the Judith River, Stevens again brought his sense of nation-bound geography with him, what, uh, what scholar James Scott would call seeing like a state. Um, 
and, and proposed creating a common bison hunting ground to the, to the south and the, uh, and the northeast. This was also to appease the mountain tribes, our tribes, the Kootenai, the Salish, the, uh, and the Ponderé, as well as the Nez Perce, uh, and the, uh, the Blackfeet bands and the Judith Basin, uh, as well as the Assiniboine bands to the, uh, to the east. And as in the Hellgate Treaty, speak, uh, Stevens spoke in terms of the United States jurisdiction bound by that northern boundary. You can see the language here uh, emphasized in bold. In this treaty with Borderlands peoples, Stevens was using a geographic language to circumscribe his treaty partners in a political sense. While this establishment of jurisdiction meant a great deal to the United States delegates, it would take decades for it to matter to the indigenous parties in a practical sense. The only real certainty of the border delineation of different nation states was not at the line itself, but at sites north or south of it at forts, depots, military posts. Trading posts that would become towns later, like Fort Benton and Fort Union, and military installations, such as, uh, as Fort Shaw, they served as the visible manifestations of full-time American presence in Montana territory in the 1860s. And the counterpart in British territory uh, was Fort Hamilton, also known as Fort Whoopa, near uh, present-day Lethbridge, Alberta. In the Rockies to the west, the former fur trade forts actually shifted north as the Hudson's Bay Company was compelled to give up their property south of the 49th parallel, including Kootenai Fort, uh, which is along the, uh, the Kootenai River. And over the 1850s and 1860s, indigenous peoples continued to move around the northern Rockies and northern plains to hunt bison, to raid, to engage in diplomacy, and to trade. But things changed significantly through the 1860s in North America in general. Uh, the conclusion of the American Civil War in 1865 allowed the United States to shift its focus, shift its focus west, unencumbered by uh, you know, politics of slavery expansion. At the same time, the provinces north of the border came together in 1867 to form a constitution and a dominion government known as Canada. So the nation builders from Ottawa also set their sights on the west. And in fact, two years later, the process began to transfer Rupert's land, which was Hudson Bay property, uh, to, uh, to Canada, which was completed in 1870. And with these developments, Britain, Canada, and the United States were compelled to make the border visible on the ground. And uh, because non-native and native population shifts across the line brought the border's physical integrity into question. And in response to British Columbia's uh, Fraser River Gold Rush uh, in 1858, the U.S. and Great Britain in 58 to 62 carried out separate but complementary boundary surveys from the Salish Sea uh, out to the Rocky Mountains. And a decade later, the need to survey the boundary line along the plains, which was seen by Canadians as a uh, kind of a move of demonstrating their new nation's autonomy and self-sufficiency. Uh, they, they participated in this with their surveyors. Beginning in the spring of 1873, the surveyors began placing markers along the 49th parallel, starting at the Lake of the Woods. And they moved across the plains over the next year, and the last marker was placed in summer 1874 at Waterton Lake uh, by, by Glacier Park. In these mountains, the surveyor party, parties up physically cut a path through the forests and trees and brush to make the line invisible. And uh, you know, the, the, I noticed that the Kootenai word, or the Tanaha word for the U.S.-Canada border translates to an area cut for a line. And as you can see from this image here, that's, that, that, that speaks right to it. On the plains, they mark the line with mounds of earth, or stone cairns, or iron posts. And on a related note, these massive survey thing, surveying projects require a good deal of labor for guiding uh, survey parties and hauling astronomical equipment uh, along many different difficult stretches of territory uh, through indigenous lands. And many Native people actually provided this labor in exchange for, uh, for cash, participating in the cash uh, economy. But through the second half of the 19th century, the United States became more active in establishing settler presence in the West, promoting settlement and eventually railroads, and 
Canada would come to do the same thing. However, it was in the 1870s that we see, particularly in terms of equestrian indigenous nations and Métis hunters and traders on the Northern Plains, people identifying the boundary as a site of sanctuary or refuge from violence of separate law. In an early mo earlier model of this phenomenon was the uh, United States War against the Dakota in Minnesota in the early 1860s, in which Dakota families and refugees were compelled to flee across the border into Manitoba and remain there for several years after. In a series of gold rushes in what became Southwest Montana Territory in the 1860s and 1870s, this brought thousands of, of settlers and miners to the region, which then accelerated conflicts between uh, the United States and tribes. But these interactions also stimulated indigenous strategizing to deal with this issue. On the heels of these conflicts, the U.S. Army invaded the, North, uh, or the uh, Missouri River country in a pretty big way. It constructed military forts uh, and, uh, in the later 1870s as clashes with mobile bison hunting, uh, uh, bison oriented Blackfeet and Lakota peoples took on more defensive measures. As mentioned, bands and hunt, uh, hunting and trading party, parties of the Blackfoot Confederacy, they regularly moved across the border at will, often out of the reach of U.S. authorities. However, in 1869, North of Helena, the murder of a settler with ties to a band of Blackfeet initiated a disproportionate response by the U.S. Army. In 1870, an Army contingent was sent north to track down the Blackfeet band under Mountain Chief, who was accused of harboring the murderers, and to do so before Mountain Chief could escape north of the border. Instead, the command under Eugene Baker encountered a different man, uh, Chief Heavy Runner's camp at the Marias River. And these soldiers still gunned down the non-combatants, nonetheless, a pretty horrific and a chilling uh, massacre in Montana's history. And such military violence in the borderlands set the tone for the Lakotas and the Nez Perce and the Cree and the Métis uh, over the next 15 years. Indigenous nations, whose homelands were not exclusively situated along the path of the 49th parallel, but who were drawn to this zone out of necessity. Since the late 1860s, Lakota and Cheyenne peoples have been defending their territories from settler invasion, particularly around the Black Hills, present-day Wyoming and uh, in South Dakota, in a conflict known as uh, by the Americans as Red Cloud War. And though the second Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 quelled Lakota and American conflict for a time, the discovery of gold in the Black Hills in the mid-1870s spurred renewed interest in the region. The U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry was dispatched to subdue the region and pave the way for gold seekers. And in doing so, they tracked Lakota and Cheyenne parties to the Little Bighorn River in the uh, summer of 1876. And the Lakotas under Chiefs uh, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse successfully routed the cavalry led by George Custer. But these Lakota leaders knew that more long knives, as they called the Americans, would be sent after Custer's defeat. Over that long winter and into spring of 1877, Crazy Horse's people eventually reported to the agency that Sitting Bull hastened his people north, beyond the Missouri River, into the Old Woman's Country, which is British, the British Queen Victoria's. The army relentlessly pursued Sitting Bull, but was forced to halt their march as the Lakotas crossed the border in 1877. This imaginary space became known as the Medicine Line for its mysterious but powerful properties that kept the long knives at bay. This trim was a, a, one that had been used for a while by many different indigenous groups on the northern borderlands. Many called it the Medicine Road uh, before the actual line itself came into more, more into focus. While in Canada, near the Wood Mountains in present-day Saskatchewan, Sitting Bull and his people developed functional relationships with the Northwest Mounted Police. <clears throat> the Mounties tolerated their presence as long as they followed the Queen's laws. But just as the rest of Indian country was adapting to the devastating conditions arising from the bison population collapse, so too were the Lakotas on the Canadian prairies. They could not remain without bison hunting themselves. And by 1881, more and more Lakota families and parties 
were returning south as a means of survival. And eventually so too did Sidney Bolt's group. That year, he surrendered to the U.S. Army, which escorted his group from Fort Buford, present day North Dakota. But for an important moment, the medicine line did serve as a sanctuary for Sidney Bolt's people to, to regroup. It, it served its role in that way. At the same time that the, the Lakotas were across the line, the Nimipu, or the Nez Perce, were dealing with similar constraints in their, uh, in their uh, northern Oregon and central Idaho homelands. According to an 1863 treaty with the U.S. government, all Nez Perce were to relocate to the Lapway Reservation along the Clearwater River. Some bands of the Nez Perce did not agree to this treaty in the first place. Chief Joseph, Whitebird, and Tehula Hooksook, the non-treaty bands as they were known, they did what they could to remain independent in Oregon. But encroachments by settlers and ensuing, con uh, ensuing confusion and friction uh, soon led to conflict. And it was conflict that brought the U.S. Army to suppress any uh, Nez Perce resistance or independence in many ways. Longtime bison hunters, Nez Perce peoples knew the Great Plains geography pretty well. They even had representatives present at the Judith River Treaty Council with the Black Feet in 1855. So they were aware of the change in jurisdiction that happened <clears throat> at the medicine line, as demonstrated by the, by, as recently by the and so in the summer of 1877, uh, these Nez Perce launched a campaign of evasion and defensive maneuvers. And over the next several months, combat with the U.S. Army pushed the Nez Perce into the Yellowstone and then the Missouri River countries. And by then, their strategy came to center solely on the medicine line. In late September, going into October of 1877, the Nez Perce found themselves at the Bear Paws Mountain. Bears Paw Mountains, uh, 40 miles from the Canada border. And at that point, the U.S. Army detachment under General Nelson Miles combined with other forces to intercept the Nez Perce and prevent them from escaping across the border. The Army siege of the Nez Perce at Bears Paw prevented the entire group's crossing for the most part, but several hundred did make an, an escape amidst the chaos, and they, it was they who had, uh, remained in Canada for, for a time. Chief Joseph and the rest of his party did surrender to the army and were held as POWs down in Indian uh, territory, which is present-day Oklahoma. And in this situation, the army served as a de facto border patrol unit that worked to keep people in rather than to keep outsiders out. A decade later, indigenous sanctuary crossings occurred from the opposite direction. In the Canadian case, Cree and Métis peoples on the Northern Plains found themselves at odds with the Canadian government regarding the fulfillment of treaty promises. Through the 1870s, a relatively new Dominion of Canada cleared the way for white settlement by negotiating treaties with indigenous nations, including Crees, Blackfoot, Assiniboines, and others in the north. These included Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 in present-day Saskatchewan and Alberta. Though these treaties promised annuities, the provisions were slow in coming which was really a life and death situation in a place where the bison populations that had sustained their, uh, them were, uh, were disappearing at an alarming rate. And this coincided with the Métis people's push for recognition of an independent Métis nation and a land base, a cause that would eventually be led by a man named Louis Riel. The Métis made attempts at the Red River Settlement in present Manitoba in 1869 and 1870. And, uh, for those of you who were here last month for the Extreme History Lecture, uh, storyteller Chris Latre, uh, he, uh, he talked about this Métis identity and uh, the, the struggles that they have faced since this 1885 moment all the way up to today for the, uh, for the little show that uh, received re recognition just a few years ago. But uh, if, you, if you want any more background on that, Chris Latre is the person to go to. Um, and uh, just worked out that our talks uh, to jump, uh, jump back on each other. Uh, but by 1884, the Métis under Louis Riel back, who was just back from exile in Montana, actually, uh, they held talks with disaffected indigenous leaders such as uh, Cree chief Poundmaker. Uh, and many of Poundmaker's Crees would join the Métis in a general resistance in spring of the following year, 1885. In response, Ottawa, 
dispatched the Northwest Mounted Police Forces to suppress the resistance and round up the combatants who participated in this general campaign, or whoever was lumped in with the combatants. And this is where Creed bands, particularly those affiliated with Chief Big Ben, who wished to avoid being associated with the resistance and in turn with Canadian law, they sought sanctuary across the 49th parallel. This is where uh, uh, Cree bands that moved south to Montana with uh, Big Bear's son, Little Bear, they did all they could to survive without a recognized land base in the territory through and after 1855. Because of their status as foreign or British Crees, they could not be added to the 1873 reservation set aside for the Blackfoot, uh, Blackfeet, uh, Anan, Cinnaboyan, and uh, it, was, it was later known as the uh, the Great Blackfeet Reservation, but it might not have mattered anyway. That reservation would be dismantled into three different reservations with agencies at Fort Peck, Fort Belknap, uh, and the uh, Blackfeet Agency in 1888. But in the meantime, these various bands and extended family, uh, family units of Crees sought a more secure situation in the United States, but Indian agents and just Montanans in, Montanans in general saw them narrowly as basically just marauders from Canada. When the Cree band's difficult situation reached a fever pitch in 1892, when the U.S. government appropriated funds to deport them back up to Canada from their various camps around the state. Almost immediately after, they relocated Crees and their property were loaded off trains in present-day Saskatchewan. They loaded back up and crossed back into Montana on foot or on a horse. And some even returned before the, the troops that were assigned to their relocation made it back to Fort Assiniboine. Uh, present day Havern. Uh, and that included uh, uh, John J. Pershing, who was known for World War I you know, fame and, and the uh, European uh, conflict. But uh, he was there for us in the morning. At that time, clearly there was little that could be done in terms of full time border patrolling at the boundary line itself. Although in 1904, a U.S. immigration inspector told uh, U.S. Senator Joseph Dixon. Uh, that the government might build an electrified fence from the Pacific to the Great Lakes that would prevent the entries of unsanctioned and unwanted migrants, including the Crees. Such infrastructure was more science fiction than anything, uh, but uh, <coughs> Dixon presented it to Congress. Nothing could happen from it, but. Such infrastructure, uh, oh, uh, the Crees under Little Bear and under the uh, the Chippewa of uh, Chief Stonechild, or also known as Rocky Boy, that had been in Montana for decades as well, also without a reservation, they eventually did secure a land base, a reservation known as the Rocky Boy Reservation, which was at the former military uh, Fort Assiniboine uh, near, near Havre. And this was, you know, could be seen as a positive development, but it was through the people enduring many winters, decades, of uh, cold, hunger, uncertainty. And for groups on the plains, it was their mobility that had previously been a crucial element of their subsistence practices, but now it became an, a liability in an increasingly ordered world. In 1887, the Tanaha, whose land centered on the Kootenai River between Columbia Lake and BC, down to Libby, Montana, back up to Kootenai Lake, they ran into issues of the borders coming to them. Tanaha found, uh, Tanaha bands that found themselves in British Columbia did not have treaties with Canada, but the bands located in the United States would be associated with the Flathead Indian Reservation. And the reserves in BC that were established were really quite small and isolated by comparison to Flathead. In spring 1887, a Tanaha man was accused of murdering two white gold miners on the Kootenai River in BC and was arrested by the local constable and jailed. The Kootenai chief Isidore would not stand for this injustice, and he and his group of supporters broke the accused out of jail at Wild Horse Creek in response, but in response to the jailbreak event, local settlers sounded the alarm of an outbreak and demanded that Ottawa send them out to police, which they did. In particular, the Mounties feared that Kootenays, who had already ignored the border and frequently met with each other up and down the Kootenay River corridor from Cranbrook down to Flathead, uh, they were seen as, as potentially hostiles 
In the Mounted Police under uh, Major Sam Steele, they coordinated with the U.S. Army Command at Fort Missoula uh, to intercept any potential cross-border assembly of Kootenai uh, Kootenai combatants in the summer of 1887. The detachment rushed up from Fort Missoula to the tobacco plains at present-day Eureka and stationed themselves in the valley bottom at the 49th parallel and monitored the local Kootenays to discourage their movement north, out of U.S. jurisdiction. Soon the situation calmed, and Sam Steele celebrated a prevented outbreak, but this entire episode was, was caused by overblown alarm by a select few British Columbia settlers. But either way, the multilateral force of a constabulary, constabulary and military coordinated a border patrol operation that had short and long-term effects, namely compelling borderlands Kootenai bands to stay on one or the other side of the line and to remove to the reserve or the reservation, and to remain there on a permanent basis through the rest of the decade and into the 20th century, for the most part. Now, the line itself, it was through the 1910s, the, the World War I years, that uh, the United States and Canada began committing full-time resources to border enforcement and immigration inspection uh, apparatus at the line itself. These included ports of entry at sites where a road or a trail crossed the 49th. And most of these uh, ports date from uh, the 1900s to the 1930s or so. And the stations did not always have inspectors or customs agents present 24-7. Uh, they still don't. Uh, some were only open seasonally, at the, such as the, uh, the Chief Mountain Crossing uh, by Glacier Park, which actually is the highest port of entry uh, uh, in terms of elevation uh, in, in North America at 5,500 feet. That was that first image that I had on the, on the first slide. By the turn of the century, certainly by the mid-1910s, indigenous peoples of the border zone were compelled to and uh, were assigned to relocate to re reservations in the United States and reorient their political activities towards American society and government. However, this is not to say that individuals, families, and extended families ceased to move across the line to, to visit, to live for short-term or long-term periods of time, to marry and to raise families, or to endeavor to continue practicing the ceremonies and celebrations with kin on the other side that defines their trans-border indigenous nationhood. At the same time, those in, uh, in res on reservations in Montana, from Fort Peck to Flathead, they found their communities and lands subject to the policy of allotment in the 1900s. Allotment was a U.S. federal government policy that was designed to break up communally held reservation lands and assign smaller plots of land to individual tribal member families. This was to encourage allottees to farm the land and become more like their white American neighbors. But assigning allotments to tribal members meant determining who was an official member of the tribe or of the tribal confederation. And once the various northern reservations were selected for allotment in the 1800s, government agents compiled official lists of members. These lists, also known as the roles, reflected enrollment in the tribe based on ancestry and, uh, and family. But confusion arose when some individuals or family members were born outside of the United States in Canada, often just a few miles north of the boundary line itself. To adjudicate the cases of those with family connections to bands in BC or Alberta or Saskatchewan, the U.S. Indian agent would hold enrollment councils at the agency. At these councils, tribal leaders and community members would review applications for enrollment by those considered by the U.S. government to have Canadian ties which a generation before would not have made any sense. But these councils were held to the 1910s and 1920s. More, more often than not, councils would approve the applications of people affiliated with their indigenous nation if the community members knew personally the applicants or their families. In this way, communities and extended families could maintain kinship uh, ties in spite of the rigid categories of, uh, of membership and citizenship established by the Office of Indian Affairs, the present-day BIA. Over the next century, Native nations in Montana focused uh, on their uh, development, their, their economies, 
and adapting their systems of governance while doing everything they could to protect tribal lands and expand tribal sovereignty in their partnerships with the U.S. government. Since the 1970s, we've seen a number of important developments in indigenous transborder consciousness and activity that deliberately de-emphasizes this artificial border. Many nations have worked to invoke the Jay Treaty in American courts, which was uh, an agreement between Great Britain and the United States from 1794 that guarantees, among a number of other things, the rights of Indians to pass free passage between the U.S. and Canada. And this has resulted in allowing First Nations from Canada to enter and stay in the United States without paying um, import duties, or being subject to uh, stay limits, which other travelers uh, from Canada do receive. So, for instance, First Nations people can attend college in the United States without it, without a student visa. Political organizing across the border at the level of individual indigenous nations and with intertribal governance groups such as the Assembly of First Nations of Canada and the National Congress of American Indians in the U.S. They developed coordinated working groups for a time, really in the 1970s and 80s. We've seen co-coordinated cultural revitalization efforts uh, by community members of nations across the border, including hosting and attending events such as powwows or sun dances, and assembling a critical mass of community knowledge towards uh, language restoration, all by folks from reserves in Canada and reservations in the U.S. In 2008, Leroy Little Bear, the Kainai First Nation uh, in Alberta, he began talks about how to restore the bison population according to indigenous ways of knowing and conservation practices. Little Bear's vision culminated in the 2014 Buffalo Treaty with historically bison-oriented tribes and First Nations uh, from the mountains and the plains, the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes, uh, they were one of the preceding stories of this, uh, of this agreement. They wanted a plan to uh, institute a plan for bringing back the bison population according to a program that all parties can agree to. And the Buffalo Treaty is reaffirmed each year, and more and more indigenous nations have added their signatures to the treaty. And the parties have deliberately uh, chosen not to include the Canadian or United States governments as, uh, as partners in the agreement. Finally, there's been a really interesting development in the past decade with a court case that, uh, decided by the Supreme Court of Canada in 2021. A man named Rick Disitel, an enrolled member of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State, which is a confederated confederation made up of 12 different uh, tribal groups, including the Sinai Nation, he purposely crossed the border into British Columbia and shot an elk, out of season and as an American citizen. But he asserted that his tribal nation, the Sinaiks, their aboriginal territories were and are located mostly north of the 49th parallel, and that uh, even though many of his people relocated to the southern portion of their territories, which are now in the U.S., they never gave up their hunting rights uh, that are really protected by the Canadian Constitution. And the Supreme Court of Canada determined that, yes, the Sinai's people do have hunting rights as, quote, Aboriginal people of Canada. What does it mean to be of Canada? Historically, or present day, that's what they were uh, determining, and the, the rights were affirmed. So border tribes in the U.S. have been, since 2021, trying to figure out how to go about exercising their, their hunting rights uh, north of the border, our, our tribes included, CSKT. So by way of conclusion, clearly there is a historical background to all these recent political developments, and these histories play important roles in the present and future of indigenous nations in Montana and around all, all around the North American West. So next time you go north to go see a uh, Calgary Flames game, or you go skiing up at Bernie, you know, just remember that you're moving through a space that is both bordered by our governments in profound and profound uh, ways, and yet, that are part of unbroken homelands of indigenous nations that have made these lands uh, their, their own since time immemorial. So thank you. Thank you.